Thanks for tuning in for this message from Momentum Church. We invite you to subscribe to this feed to receive a steady stream of encouragement, inspiration and wisdom from God's Word. Bless the Lord. I've called this message to the glory of God. And I've been speaking about last week and even from Andrew's message, the glory of God and, um, and his glory and who he is. And so I wanted to continue on that as I share this. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we know the scripture well. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm sure we've all heard this scripture many, many times and we've seen the scripture many, many times and Paul is writing that the aim of verse 1 and 2 is that all life, all life would become spiritual worship. And we said last week that, remember, singing songs makes no demand on our lives but true worship does. True worship makes a demand on our lives. That everything we do and everything we give in worship, has it will cost. There is a demand. You cannot really worship God without it costs something. And Paul's writing in here, the aim of all human life in God's eyes is that Christ would be made to look as valuable as he truly is. That Christ would be made to look as valuable as he truly is. Worship, true worship that demands something from us means using our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. It means using every part of us to express the worth of God for all that he is and all that he is in us in Christ Jesus. Paul writes that there is a way to live, a way to love that does that. And there is a way to love, to live and love life. There is a way to live and love family and friends. A way to live and love others in this crazy world that we live in. There is a way to live and there is a way to love. And he writes it there in the verses. Down the bottom it says, we must be transformed. He shows us what to do and he says, you've got to be transformed. You've got to be renewed. How we do this and how this is going to work out is for a message in a few weeks' time. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, I want to share a message about the apex and the pinnacle of God's grace, God's goodness. And then after that, I want to share and talk about what are these roadblocks and how do we move into that? How do we become, it's easy to say these things, but how do we become the things that God is asking us to move into? But I share this verse to highlight God has a will, a desire, a purpose, and we shared last week that God has a purpose to display his glory. And so when we look at these scriptures in Romans and Ephesians and 2 Timothy, we can see that God's purpose, his purpose, no one else's, it's his purpose. It was conceived in him and his purpose is eternal. And his purpose conceived in him is accomplished through Christ Jesus before time began. God's purpose was made and determined in eternity past. It will be carried out in time. It will be carried out in eternity present. And the results will stand forever in eternity future. Eternity is all-encompassing. It will last and it will go through and his purpose, his glory will move in all that. We spoke last week and said this statement. There is an absolutely sovereign, transcendently pure, self-existing, self-sustaining, incomparably beautiful, all-knowing, all-wise, all-governing, all-upholding, all-defining, infinitely valuable, all-satisfying God. He is everywhere, past, present and future. And these words do not do justice to the greatness of our God. Our English language and these words that we have do not do justice to how amazing God is. This God, our God, who we worship, whose purpose in all creation 
and all redemption and all history and all culture is to display his glory for the everlasting, ever-increasing enjoyment of his redeemed people. Are you one of his redeemed people? There's a purpose that God has for you and there's a purpose that he's showing you. That's you and I. That is anyone who is a disciple of Jesus. Anyone who's not just a believer, but someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Plenty of people are believers, but not followers. It becomes clear that God creates, redeems, rules in order to put his glory on display, to exalt it, to make it stand out. This begs the question, why would God want to do that? And why would God want to involve you and I? Why would he want to involve these flawed beings? I think we can all say without hesitation, have you made a mistake this week? Yeah. Have you did something you wish you didn't do this week? Yes. Have you uh, gone somewhere and thought things you shouldn't have thought? Yes. Why would God then want to use these flawed beings? Why would our incredibly amazing God want not just to display, but involve us in the display of his glory? Said the ant farmer to the ant, I choose you. If you want to know more about what that meant, listen to last week's message. Why? Why would God choose you? The simple answer is this. Because... Because it just has to happen. It just has to happen because God is immutable. He is Elohim. It has to happen. There are certain things that are absolute that cannot be changed. It just is and we have to accept that it just is. If we turn off the lights and turn them back on again, the darkness cannot stop the light. The darkness cannot stop the light for the darkness is mere an absence of light. It is guaranteed, it is certain, darkness cannot be in light. God is light. Uh, I've been reading this book, and in this book, Case for Heaven. Has anyone read this book by Lee Strabell? It's a great book, and as I'm going through it, he writes that in interviews with people like Pastor John Burke, who you'll see up on the screen later, who studied thousands of... Thousands of near-death experiences, and he's talking to them. And let me say, when I say he's talked to people with near-death experiences, uh, Lee did ask him, how do you know who is real and who is just making it up? Because plenty of people make it up. And he said, I've learned to discern and I've learned to see which ones are real and which ones aren't. But this book, it talks about this bright light, a light brighter than the sun, excuse me, <clears throat> a light brighter than the sun, and yet you can look straight into this light. There is a radiance from God that shines outward because he is God. These glory shines because he is God. His light shines because he is God. His goodness shines because he is God. His love shines and emanates because he is God. His word is true and shines because he is God. His word cannot return void because he is God. It cannot stop because he is God. So when we ask, why does this have to happen? Because he is God. There is no other way around it. He is God. And certain things have to happen because he is God. Now, God does not display his, his glory because of ego or selfishness. In fact, when we read the Bible and we write in the, in the Old Testament, he says, God says, I am a jealous God. We're reading form instead of function. And we're saying, oh, God is jealous. We've got to look at why he's saying he's jealous and what is he bringing out. Does God do these things? So he can stand and be there like some dictator that says, worship me, let your glory come to me. No, of course not. It's because of who he is that everything emanates out. Everything moves out. He cannot stop it no more than you can try and, and allow darkness to exist in light. It cannot happen. He shines outward. It reflects back to him by all creation because he is God. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, For God who said, Let there be light in darkness, and has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, sorry, iPad's doing something funny. 
See, in the face of Jesus Christ, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure that makes it clear that our great power is from God, not of what? Not from ourselves. It's important for us to know that. And as we shared last week, that when you understand God's purpose for God, it makes our purpose for us a lot clearer. And our purpose for us has got nothing to do with what I want to do, but God desires that what I want to do is what he would like to do. When we go to Ezekiel, and we know this scripture, we see the reverse or the antithesis of what God is saying. That in this passage, in this chapter of Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel shows us the passage of the anointed angel, Lucifer, the Latin name, or Satan as we know. And remember, it's not his name, it's his description. They didn't give a name to him. I'm sure he has a name, but they don't say the name. They show who he is and what he does because he's not worthy of having a name. But it's his, Satan, his deceiver. Lucifer is the Latin part of it. And it describes who he is. He's a filthy, rotten, stinking, lying, cheating person. Or being, I should say. That his aim is to steal, kill and destroy. His aim is to deceive you and take away the truth of God that would enter into your hearts and into your minds and into your bodies that would allow revelation to come in. And God can do this, come up seal. This is how close the devil can work. And I might have shared this before, but I was praying for someone and as I was praying for someone and sharing a word and, uh, and saying what, I don't remember what I said, but as I was saying these things and sharing what God said, thanks, this close... Afterwards, Trudy rang me and says, hey, you better talk to so-and-so. They said this and this and this and this. I said, I didn't say that. She says, well, I didn't think you would say that. So I rang the person up, and when I said what I said, this person said, no, I heard this and this. I said, that's not what I said. And the moment I said that, I realized, wow, the enemy stole it this close. This close, the enemy stole the words and perverted it. That's how much he is against us hearing truth. That's how much he's against us hearing truth. And Ezekiel is showing this part. When the deceiver tries to take for himself some of the glory of God, he is cast down. So there is a price that is paid at some point when though we keep the glory for ourselves. There will be a price and there will be a payment at some stage when we try and keep the glory. Ed Cole says, use the gold, but do not touch the glory. God has a purpose in putting his glory on display because God wants to be glorified in you and through you. God wants to be marveled in you and through you. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to have the infinite worth of his all-satisfying beauty reflected back to him by you because it has to go out. And when it touches something, it comes back into who he is for the everlasting, increasing enjoyment of his redeemed people, just you and I. God places us in this purpose because he loves us. He loves us. I've been picking on some scriptures lately that I find that we say, and we do this because this is what we're taught, but they're totally out of context. One of those things that we say is, well, Jesus died for me. No, he didn't. He had to die for us, for us. He had to die for sin. He died for obedience to the Father. Nowhere in the Bible will you find Jesus says, I'm dying for the people. The Father said, I'm sending my son because I love the people, but God so loved the world. But Jesus died because of obedience to the Father. And I'm, he wanted to. He says, I'll do it. But having our language right and having things right, Jesus died for us. He didn't die and he didn't go there and because, well, because I had to. You know what I'm saying? It can seem like a simple thing. But understanding God sent his son for me. God sent his son because the price had to be paid. And Jesus said, I'll do it. I'll give myself because I want to be obedient to the Father. The value of God's glory is reflected in how I treasure it. The value, the beauty, the worth of God's glory is appropriately reflected back to him in the degree to which I accept it, how I treasure it, how I enjoy it, how I embrace it, how I delight in it, how I am satisfied by it, with, and how I live it over everything else in the planet. 
If there is anything that has more of my heart, more of my passion, more of my affections, more of my time, talent and treasure, what then it, whatever it is, is glorified above him. Ezekiel 28. It's a sobering text. He desires all that I have. And his goodness is such that his patience is such that he walks with us to enable us to go on this journey knowing, well, I didn't make it today, God. I really mucked that one up. Help me again, Lord Jesus. And he picks us up. And the next day, well, I didn't do that well today, Lord. Help me again, Lord Jesus. And he picks us up. God makes known the riches of his glory for our treasuring, our value and our enjoying and our knowing. Let me say he reveals his glory to us. When he reveals his glory to us, he doesn't get any honour if we find it mundane or boring. I think that a life that is bored in Christianity, I wonder if they've actually met Jesus. Or at the very least, they've forgotten their first love. Because a life that is in true relationship with Jesus, that understands and gets to know God, gets to know Jesus, gets to know the Holy Spirit, it is not boring. It is life abundant. In Romans, Paul is writing to the Christian church, and by the time he's writing this book, um, there's many... Uh, Some of the Jews had gone out, but he's writing to Jews and to Gentiles. He's writing to the Greeks. And he puts this statement out there, and he says, That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not children of God, but the children of promise are counted as a seed. So throughout Romans, Paul is writing this description, and he's showing this gap and this difference between those who are walking after the flesh and those who are walking after God. The true, these are not the children of God. These are the children of God. These don't walk in promise. These walk in promise. And he's writing this out. Now remember, the value of God's glory is reflected in how I treasure it. And Paul highlights this in Romans 9. So in Romans chapter 9, I've gone for the New Living Translation up on the screen there. And it says, in the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power. Other versions say wrath. Wrath is the punishment for an offence or crime, but it can also be seen as God's love in action against sin. So God, wrath and power are two elements of God's glory. He says if God has the right to show his anger and show his power, and he is very patient. Other version says enduring patience. I, I, I like some of the words in this and some in the other scriptures. I find enduring patience is a great description. He has got enduring patience. I go, thank you, Lord. I need that a lot. Enduring patience, it's another aspect of his glory. In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction. What a verse. He's able to show it for those that are destined for destruction. In Romans, Paul is writing and saying that there is this lump of clay. And from this lump of clay, I have created these jars, these vessels that can be filled. And some of these jars, even though they knew the promise was there, they rejected the promise. In fact, they crucified the promise. And they didn't want anything to do with the promise. And then there's these other ones, these children of faith, these children who have believed in me, believed in my promise, and they're filling themselves up with my goodness and these two disparaging places between those who have not and those who have God. Those who are walking with him, with, with him and those who are choosing not to. You can't confuse the two jars. <laughs> the jars can't mix. And so he's painting this picture of everyone, remember, Everyone came from the same filthy lump of clay. Everyone came from the same lump. And in verse 23, he's going to tell us why God has the right to show wrath and the right to show patience. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy. Amen. Who were prepared in advance for glory and we are among those whom he selected both from the Jews and the Gentiles. Let me paraphrase it a little bit. 
That God is saying, I am shining on you, my children of promise. Those I have shown mercy to. Let me stop and say, mercy was shown to both jars. Mercy was shown to both jars, but one jars and one side didn't want to, and he said, they're not my children. Those that don't want to accept, they're not my children. But these ones who do, whether you're a Jew, a Greek, a Gentile, or an Aussie, doesn't matter which jar, if you accept this promise, you obtain an inheritance. And we are grafted in. And so I'm shining on you, my children of promise, those that I've shown mercy, whether Jew or Gentile, the riches of my glory, that is Christ Jesus. Amen. This shining light of glory is amplified. It's even brighter when you see that I could have put my wrath, I could have put my anger on those who rejected my son Jesus and therefore are destined for destruction. I could have dealt with them quickly, but I chose to show enduring patience. I chose to show enduring patience with them. Therefore, God is saying he is highlighting this chasm. He is highlighting this gap between those who have not chosen and those who have chosen. And for us who are part of this shining light of his mercy, if, we, if it's not even good enough, just have a look at what he could have done for those. And what he could have done, and he says, I am showing my enduring patience. And when we look at the nature of God, I know he's going, so that perhaps, perhaps they might decide to choose. That we would give them as much time as necessary and as long as necessary that they might choose a way. Now God, of course, already knows who is and who isn't. But he shows us this enduring gap, this enduring patience, so it would shine on us. God's goodness, grace, and mercy is beaming brighter than the sun to us, his vessels of mercy. For us to be bored, for us to be dissatisfied, for us to be complacent with him? No, of course not. But for us to enjoy, to embrace, to exalt, to praise and honour, and for us to live for him, to die for him. Even when we get to glory, even when we get to glory, and if time works the same way as it does here, and we say, God, I want to see more of your love. I want to see more of your love. We could travel for billions and billions of years. We could climb that, that explanation of his love for billions of years. And the moment you get to the pinnacle, the moment you climb to the top, all you will see is endless peaks of his love because it is inexhaustible. It is inexhaustible. He is immutable. He is infinite. He cannot change. He has no end. And he is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When we are most satisfied in him. Whatever we do in life, do it to the glory of God. Which means do everything to make him look great. Do everything to make God look great. That's not as easy as it sounds. Because we are inherently consumed with self. And even as I was putting the slide up this week and going to the, to the glory of God, I was going, I can't put my picture in this. It seems a bit hypocritical to put my picture on this when I'm saying to the glory of God and then I've got to put my picture up there. No, to him and to glory to him and who he is. So treasure him. Value him. Be so satisfied in him above every kind of conceivable happiness that would make him, God, Yahweh, Yeshua, look more and be more valuable than anything in your life. Matthew writes, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God, your Father, who is in heaven. The goal of my life should be to live in a way that when people 
know me and see me well enough, they would say, God is glorious. That they would not say Harold is glorious. That they would not say Harold did this. In fact, I, it's one of the things that I've looked and I've always thought that when my time comes to go home and be with the Lord, and I've always said to the Lord, make sure I go first before seal, otherwise who's going to make my lunch? <laughs> when my time is up, <laughs> when my time is up, the only thing I hope people remember is Harold loved the Lord. That's the only thing I want them to know. He was a man who loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, and mind. He was someone that would give everything for Jesus. Here is someone that served him. I don't care if they don't remember the church, remember the ministry, remember the singing, remember the writing, remember anything I do, but they would remember. Here is a man who loved God. That's what I desire. That's what I desire. Jesus gives us some help in the Lord's Prayer. And he says every part of these lines that we know in this Lord's Prayer is a sentence. It's a, not just a petition. It's not just asking, but it's a declaration. It's an acclamation. Thou Father which art in heaven, if you're like me, I can't do this prayer without it being King James. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, let your name, who you are, be, be in my life that I would glorify that name who you are. Let your kingdom, all that you are, all that you're about, let, let me walk in that kingdom. Let me walk in that way so that I can say and pray and declare this verse, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Use me, O God, in this area, all through this passage. It is out there for us to glorify our amazing and holy God that the world filled with those that don't know him would look at us and say, their God must be awesome. Why do you think the devil's working so hard to destroy Christianity? Why do you think he's working so hard to make it sound like Christianity is the worst thing you could be? The Christianity has got nothing. It's, it's useless. Why do you think they're not doing that to other beliefs? Because they know the power in the blood of Jesus that we as Christians should walk in. They know the power of the blood of Jesus that we are able to move in. The power of the blood of Jesus that washes us and transforms us and renews us that we can stand it. They can look at us and say, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. And he writes in Matthew, he says, the outworking of those good works that there is a cost involved. I know Jesus, but don't do anything. James is saying, you're not even showing me faith. I'll show you my faith by my works because I'm doing something for him. The implications of God's glory is on display for us to shine it back to him is quite plain. If the God is I am and he is, and if he created the universe in order to go on display of who he is with the riches of his glory, that it would shine out upon us, his vessels of mercy, that we would see that and reflect it back to him in all that we do so the infinite value of the riches of his glory might be obvious in our lives. Basically, if his glory is undisplayed and moving out, that I would reflect that glory in such a way that would show nothing but Jesus, my life has now been defined. And so often we get confused with purpose and achievement. That we look at achievement as more of the goal instead of purpose. But it's our purpose in him, the achievement will come. If we have place ourselves looking at achievement first, we become focused on the task instead of the task giver. One day, one glorious day, Habakkuk tells us this, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Make a good song that. <laughs> that the earth will be filled with the glory. One day we will see this, that the glory of God God's original purpose, what he originally intended, to fill the earth with his glory. His glory reflected through creation, through us as human beings, will be fulfilled. Well, I shared last week the reality of a Christian walk of faith from the brutal honesty of scripture. Eva said, are you going to give us another slap in the face? I said, maybe. <laughs> the brutal honesty of scripture that should at times give us a 
reality checkup, a spiritual slap in the face, so to speak. Let me share a real life story of love. A balance of the goodness of God because he is good and it's the love of God that leads us to repentance. And by the way, it's his love that many times shows us where we're in fault and where we need to change because it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. In showing us, Harold, you're wrong. I'm what? You're wrong. I'm sorry, Lord, you are wrong. Not words that we like too much. And he shows us because he loves us. The immutability of God means that you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have all of his love without that love searching your heart and going, you need to change. You can't stay like this. You need to be different. No matter how much our sense of justice demands, because God's justice is not our justice, there is always the just scales of God. In his book, The Case for Heaven, as I said, I've been reading this. He was interviewing a guy called Pastor John Burke. He's the founding pastor of the Gateway Community Church. Not to be confused with Gateway Church in Fort Worth, Texas. This church is Austin, Texas, which I found out is about two and a half hours apart. And so he's written, this guy has written several books, as you can see. Imagine, this is the guy, Pastor John Burke is the guy that has interviewed thousands of people on... Has anyone read that book? But Pastor John Burke, he's written many books on interviewing people with near-death experiences and what they experience. Now, one of the people that John was speaking to that he interviewed was this guy. Um, anyone know this guy? Ian McCormick. He's a Kiwi. And in 1980, he wrote a book, Night Dive to Heaven, because in 1980, he was diving in Mauritius. You know, he was in Mauritius and he was diving and he got stung. Now, in this book it says four, but he's actually five. He was stung by five jellyfish. One of the jellyfish was enough to put him into cardiac arrest and he was stung by five of them. And he writes in this book, I want to read out some passages and he says, I know time is getting away from me, but... Ian was dying, Burke said. He saw visions of his mother who had told him to call out to God if he ever needed help. He was in utter darkness and felt terrified. He prayed for God to forgive his sins. Ian was an atheist. He had no connection with God. He didn't know God at all. But his mother, praise the Lord, told him to call out to that. And a bright light shined at him and literally drew him out of darkness. He described the light as unspeakably bright, as if it was the center of the universe, more brilliant than the sun, more radiant than any diamond, brighter than a laser beam, yet you could look right into it. He said this presence knew everything about him, which made him feel terribly ashamed. But instead of judgment, he felt pure, unadulterated, clean, unhibited, undeserving love. He began weeping uncontrollably. Ian asked if he could step into the light, and as he did, he saw them in the middle of the light of a man with dazzling white robes, garments literally woven from light, who offered his arms to welcome him, and he said, I knew that I was standing in the presence of Almighty God. Beck paused, and he said to John, Remember the transfiguration in Matthew 17 too? It says Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. It reminds me of that. He says, I asked Burke, um, Lee asked Burke to elaborate on the life review that so many people go through during their near death experience. It occurs in being in the presence, uh, being in the presence of a present being of light, and it often begins with him asking something like, What have you done with the life I gave you? It's not set in judgment, but in love to prompt reflection and learning. Everything is exposed from a person's life. Every thought, every motive, every deed, nothing is hidden. What's interesting is that the focus isn't on your accomplishments or trophies or resume, but on how you loved others. It's all about relationships. People actually see and feel how their actions, even small, seemingly insignificant ones, ripple through the lives of other people, even four or five steps down the road in ways they never knew. Through it all, there is no judgment. What happens is that people tend to judge themselves. One man said he was so ashamed by his cruel and selfish behavior that he begged them to stop the review. Yet here's the thing. Jesus continued to communicate only unconditional love. 
it's quite an eye-opener and a revelation of his goodness and his love. And it brings a little bit more clarity and understanding of his goodness that leads us to repentance. That in every part of our life, we have this opportunity here on earth to allow this light of God and all that he is to transform us and move upon our hearts. One Corinthians thirteen. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God says he didn't send his son to the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. I ponder and reflect this so much and go, Lord, how much of my life was a bad reflection? How much of my life didn't display what you wanted displayed? Where I allowed who I am to be more brighter than who you are. Now we do this sometimes in our own self-preservation of self because we want to do how we think it is. But understanding his love demands a response and that response has to be that in everything you do in life in everything you do let it be for the glory of God let it be for the glory of God why are you doing these things for the glory of God why do you get here early on a Sunday for the glory of God why do you turn around and help someone when they need something for the glory of God Why do you do this and why do you want to start up ministries and do things for the glory of God? Why do you want to show things for the glory of God? And it gets exemplified, not in those things I do. It gets exemplified in the people that know me best when they see the the Harry that you don't see. And when they see that Harry, when they see that Harold, they understand and know, I see the glory of God. Oh, I'm working on that one a lot. That's not easy. I'm working hard on that one so that my family would see the glory of God through me. He is worth everything because he is everything. He is God. And if you don't have that place where you feel like you are emanating and releasing all that he is, go back to your first love. Go back to your first love. Go back to that place where you understood why Jesus meant everything to you and he meant all that he is to you. And when you find yourself in that place, pray the prayer that we should all learn to pray quickly. Yes, Lord, here I am, use me. Yes, Lord, here I am, your faithful servant. I will do whatever you ask of me. Yes, Lord, here I am. Can we stand and bow our heads? You've been listening to a message from Momentum Church. To get in touch, visit our website, momentumchurch.com.au or search Momentum Church Gold Coast on Facebook.